uh, eight years, and during this time, I worked as developer, team leader, and project manager. Uh, so I had a lot of a lot of products, and therefore want to share with you my experience and advices in actually evolution your web product to the new technology stack. Actually, do we have here developers or product owners? Oh, nice. So we have a lot to discuss uh, because actually for product owners, I want to share what they could miss in team collaboration aspects and in control of the process of product evolution. Before, uh, because uh, you can bring more to the software without extending the budget if to do it correctly. And as developers, we try to speak about a little bit of techniques and to see what they can improve in products and actually how to boost their productivity with the remote teams. So let's start. Um, I think you know these guys. Actually, they illustrate our products. So what I want to say is that uh, the meaning of life is an evolution. And I really want to stress one thing, that products always change. And that's an axiom, and if product is not evolving, it could die. Um, a lot of good pro projects or products started as a bright idea with a very small local group of developers. Then they get initial implementation, and at some point of time, uh, developers understand that they get to the next new thing, and uh, uh, when they evaluate to the new things, they could get out of the control. So I want our projects or, and products always to get to the last stage of this Homo sapiens product. So that's why I'm speaking today. Uh, so what I, I see as evolutional blockers for a lot of projects is that your current technology after MVP stage could not satisfy your current needs and you will decide to change the technology. That's actually the main goal of this, of this speech. And during the change of technology, you still need to maintain the high velocity of development. And your current local team can uh, be not such good in this process. And you still need to maintain the stability, and it could be done with two aspects, like organizational aspect and technical aspect, to monitor the stability of your product and team. Actually, what I propose is three keys to success. So, first of all, you need to establish a well thought process of evaluating the product, of changing the stack. You need to predict uh, all the risks on different stages of your evolution. Uh, then, a lot of companies decide to extend their team with remote teams, with additional new expertises, um, and we need to handle the process of communication very much. And, of course, without tools, we can't do anything good. So we'll talk about tools at the very end of my speech, so how they can help in the evolution process. Uh, and that's my opinionated view on the path of evolution of a software project, actually maybe a web project. Uh, it's pretty obvious, I think, for everyone. Uh, the only interesting thing that is post-MVP stage, uh, it's actually the main important stage of the product when you are making this uh, migration from MVP decisions in technology and the team to, to kind of a stable decisions. And we need to handle this very, very carefully. And the pivot step, when you develop a lot of things and then you decide that your project needs to turn somewhere. So you understand that initial idea was good, but you need to change something to adapt to the market. And then you need to change a lot in the product. And that would, be, that would really bring you to the post-MVP stage when you will need to organize everything once again. Um, so what I want to discuss is the case study of one interesting product. It's Gross Hackers. Um, I don't know, is there any people who knows who are Gross Hackers? Ha, ah, two people, <laughs> three. <laughs> so I will describe a little bit. So a Gross Hacker is a person that uh, he's, so he's working on the border of two things like a marketing and a technical guy. So they are, um, it's a kind of job position in a lot of startups right now when this person uh, try to involve, uh, involve as much uh, users to the product as possible with different marketing and technical activities. Uh, and this growthhackers.com is kind of community website, uh, community blog, uh, Reddit-like, and it has a special tool to track the ideas of growth and it's called the Growth Hackers Project. So it's a pretty complicated system, and 
our company actually and I'm as a team leader help them uh, from the early MVP stage to evolve to a current stable uh, stable stage so we work with them technically we evaluated ideas uh, and actually we grow there to current to current state uh, so let's see um, MVP pro MVP stage of the uh, product was based on PHP. But actually, when you're thinking about the blog and you think about PHP, first of all, you think about WordPress. Uh, that what was a really good solution for the very beginning because it really allowed to have all the functionality we needed. And the goal of the stage was to prove the idea that this community blog is really needed to users. Uh, it was successful, we really proved this and the strategy is to develop as soon as possible, to bring to market as soon as possible. Uh, actually, according to, to the researchers, for about 42% of, of the startups really fail with, uh, when they understood that uh, there is no need of such a product on the market. So we really handle this risk on the MVP stage. Uh, so for this product, it took for about three, six months. I think maybe a lot of pro other projects also will be within this time scope. Uh, but then, um, after the initial implementation, we understood that it really works, but we, had, we got a lot of users' feedback, um, which required additional functionality. Um, and technically, we understood that this additional functionality, like, for example, background jobs or asynchronous activities, it couldn't be handled very good with PHP. So, it was a decision to change the technological stack to change it to Ruby, Ruby on Rails, uh, actually to adapt the user feedback, to bring them additional value. Um, and during this time, during the implementation process, uh, old PHP versions were still working and was extensively A and B tested to get a lot of new features to understand what really users need. So during the testing of old version, we were implementing only the succeeded uh, experiments to the Ruby version. Um, and at this stage, uh, we really heavily extended the team with Ruby developers. And uh, as, as it's written here, about 23 percent of startups really fail because of uh, they have not the right team at this step. Because team or um, so your developers uh, do not understand what is the goal, or your developers doesn't have a lot of skills in such a technology. So that's really important. And it takes for about six months. Uh, then we got to the feature rich step and this is the step when you develop the main product uh, it, it is already migrated to the new technology stack and you want to extend it with the new features with, uh, uh, with Also for the growth hackers it was a community website was re-implemented and then we started this additional product uh, growth hackers project It's like a Jira like um, uh, tracking system to track the ideas to, to rank them and the goal of this step, of course, to deliver to enterprise users to get the revenue because each any product actually lives for revenue. <laughs> let's be honest. And uh, so here we implemented a lot of services, additional tools, and all of this is made not to be outcompeted by other startups in this field. You need to to, to to deliver much more value than other startups also given this field. And it was one of the longest periods of time I think for about one year when we developed this thing and at the pivoting step where we understood that to expand to a mass enterprise as a goal of the step we need to change quite a lot because a lot of the additional new customers uh, that we were willing to pay they wanted a little bit changes for example in growth hackers project tools because uh, each of them had they are a little bit different processes and they wanted some additional changes. They wanted new integrations, integrations with services like Slack, like, uh, I don't know, Jira, Pivotal uh, or something. And that required a little bit in new architecture to make a service integration. And we decided to go with this new buzzword, microservices. And uh, of course we used Docker for this to break everything down. So we tried to break our Ruby on Rails monolith. Uh, that's pretty complicated process and all of that is done is actually to eliminate this, the highest risk uh, to uh, not to have a good business model to really uh, have the startup living and about 17% of startups according to, to the research really fails at this 
And after that process, of course, when you changed a lot, uh, it, as I have said, bring us to the post MVP when we still needed to, to organize everything. Uh, so that's the use case, and I want to bring back to, to the post MVP step as it was most important, and I think uh, it has a lot of risks. Actually, uh, how would you, at your point of view, uh, um, upgrade the product of version 1.0 to 2.0? And you have the following prerequisites. You need to change the technology, you have a new design, you have a new features, you have a lot of new ideas. And of course, when you, when you write everything from scratch, you think, let's do all together. And then release the new version of the product. Uh, but who knows what you will get in the result? Because actually people, you know, they do not like changes. We have seen a lot of things when one product made a big update and uh, its user base dramatically decreased because of they do not like this new red button, so no, or actually GitHub. Oh, have you seen this dark uh, dark header in GitHub? I think GitHub lost a lot and GitLab received a lot of new users. <laughs> okay, so uh, I propose to do a small steps in this uh, process, not to do a revolution in your product. Uh, first of all, you need to actually finalize current functionality, for example, of this PHP version of product that, that was in, in the growth hackers. Uh, then, at some point, of, uh, you start re-implementation on the new platform, on the new technology, on new framework. Then you re-implement it, uh, and at some point of view, of course, you need to, fro to, frozen, to make frozen both of the products, old version and new, and new version. But uh, the main thing is that your new version should be um, the same, identical from the end user point of view. When you release the new version, your end user shouldn't notice anything. Um, and only after that, you'll be able to enhance user experience, to make new experiments or to add new features and actually measure the reaction of users because each small tiny change can get really dramatic uh, influence on performance of the system, on user experience, etc. And you, you need to be able to roll back these features one by one because uh, it's really pretty bad when you understand that you have failed with something but you can't roll it back because it was like, it, it's a monolith, you can't roll back one button, for example. And, ah, yeah, that's pretty, pretty it with the process. Um, another aspect of this evolution is actually a team because uh, people are really, the first order and non-liner components of software development, as have said Alistair Cockburn. And uh, actually, your people need to have these red bikes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> actually, what you should focus in on the team when you are working on evolution of your product? First of all, set the clear goals. So, for example, as a product owner uh, point of view, you need to discuss with the team what you want to achieve, actually. And then team proposes the ways to, to achieve that or proposes the technology to achieve. Uh, do not need to say exactly how to do something because it really demotivates people or you actually could provide not the optimal solution. And as the, po as the second point is uh, handling a lot of technical issues and gathering the result together. So a lot of, a lot of companies actually work with a project manager uh, on the remote team side that actually manages this process to, to organize people and to, to organize tasks. But in any case, product owner should be always uh, uh, like a part of the product. Product owner should leave his product and only then it would be a really successful product with, uh, with a good experience. And uh, if, to step, uh, if to make a little step from our use case about growth hackers and to say about like, you should know my business, it's uh, when product owner hires or expands his team, um, and this team should have, for example, uh, good experience in e-commerce, and you are building a new e-commerce uh, solution. And then you say, okay, you should know how to build e-commerce solution, so build me the best e-commerce solution that could, be, that could exist in the world. But it, it is never the best, while team doesn't know your special requirements, uh, while you do not say to people, for example, how, um, how you handle logistics, how you handle uh, discounts, etc. Each business has it uh, a little bit different. So uh, we, sh we should always discuss with the product owner and with the team tiny aspect uh, of the business. And of course, the product owner should talk to people. 
and this communication is very important and communication is first of all having a shared channel of communication nowadays it's really easy you would need to have a skype or at least a slack and everyone should use it uh, you should track the issues and issue tracking system and any member of your team actually should use this and my, all members should understand how it works because we really saw a lot of uh, pro projects when people actually were not really communicating while they had this communication tool just because one of them used one <laughs> messenger and another used another messenger and they said okay I just don't like those messenger I, I like another one and that's, that's pretty bad someone should really take care of this and about the team spirit uh, I can have uh, <laughs> I can give you one advice how to do how to motivate actually the team uh, almost for free and actually from product owner of you you should just be uh, kind of uh, honest with them so for example how to motivate team to do some feature very fast and uh, to, to deliver a good quality is just to say why you need this feature for example you have uh, an investment round and you need to show it to investor or you have an exhibition and sometimes you really need to bring some functionality very very fast and it could be a point of conflict or misunderstanding if you do not just just explain why you need to do this very fast uh, and have anybody here heard a statement the problem is not on our side yeah. <laughs> now you see a couple of persons here hear that uh, that actually happens when you have two teams local and remote team and your teams are not really collaborating very good with each other and someone needs to facilitate this, someone needs to really handle this, it will not resolve uh, itself. Uh, so it could be, I think maybe a product owner, a project manager who should really keep an eye on such a situation because it really uh, strikes on productivity of, of the teamwork. And of course another aspect of uh, friendliness is actually getting a brainstorming, getting a collaboration and when you discuss with, with the team your new ideas, you get a new vision of the implementation and, or you get a new vision on the features. Uh, and uh, from the product owner point of view, this, uh, this vision could be never achieved without uh, like a fresh eye. And of course, you, according to these all uh, items, we can get a trustful foundation of, uh, of collaboration. And not only product owner should trust his team, but actually team also need to respect mutual agreements and respect uh, all the things that product owner says. So it's, uh, it's two-way communication all the time. And the last thing is about tools, as I have promised in the very beginning. Actually, the main thing with this illustration, <laughs> what I want to show is that you shouldn't... Uh, ah, actually, if you have only a hammer, you shouldn't treat everything as a nail. So each each aspect of development should have its own great tools and we need to manage how to how to use them all together. One of the things that we implemented at the very beginning, if to go back to our use case in Growth Hackers, for example, this was an MVP stage. We implemented uh, automated deployment. That's actually very important because at this stage we have a lot of releases, a lot of very small releases when you develop different features and you want to deploy it as fast as possible uh, because you are de <laughs> developing as fast as possible you also deploy it very fast so we used for example ansible to automate server provisioning to, to automate deployment you can achieve it also with a lot of different tools but uh, why it is very important because it, it will store all the configs of deployment in one place no one will have the sacred knowledge and if you will lose someone from your team anyone other could be able just to get from the point and uh, start deployment after that. Yeah. The second, the second uh, scene that we've done, it's mostly on post-MVP stage. What is very important is to cover with testing, to automate the testing, because at this step, at the post-MVP, we develop a lot, a lot of new features and kind of features on the new technology. So you need to cover your functionality with tests and the easiest way is to cover it with Selenium or headless WebKit based uh, test because unit tests are a little bit uh, harder to write it's harder to maintain and they cost more than uh, kind of integration testing so because you need to take care of what is already done and uh, on the next step actually 
No? You need to make a continuous integration of all of these things. Actually, continuous integration is automated process of running tests or running, for example, a deployment. And of course, as the feature is rich step, we have, we needed to have this thing because we needed to be pretty sure that everything works as expected, that all new features that bring that brings new value to customers, that they do not broke old features that were made initially. So we used a lot of things, also a circle C, semaphore, but you can actually achieve the same with, for example, Jenkins. It's uh, it's free and you can use it by your own. And then the last step, uh, as I have said previously, we have used Docker to do microservices. Uh, it's also kind of opinionated uh, decision for this step. Should we use Docker and Rancher to orchestrate the delivery of containers? So we completely change the, the deployment process, the delivery process. Uh, but I think uh, it's uh, it's at some at some points it's a uh, it's a good solution to postpone. You know, if you know one technology very good, for example, when you knew Ansible very good, it was very good thing to automate the first step with Ansible. Then at the last step, it was like two years after that we get new additional experience and we automated it in, in other ways. So currently, deployment and development. Uh, is based on the microservices and Docker, and it uh, allows us to change very fast, to change separate services very fast, and to deploy them without uh, a big fear that we will you know, break some other parts of the system. So I want to recap all my talk here, is that sometimes it happens that you want to change the technology stack, and to succeed in this process, I propose uh, three kind of solutions to establish a good thought process to think to think beforehand about risks and possible revenues on each step uh, to extend the team and to collaborate with them very good because only with a good collaboration you can get a good productivity and of course to use tools but is it it's really up to the team what tools to use it's just my proposal for each step so you can see uh, this diagram and maybe uh, understand at which step is, ca is your current pro pro product uh, and actually the last thing that I want to wish you is to go for it and to foresee all, all the challenges that you will have on, the, on your next step. So thank you and maybe there are any questions. Okay, anyone? Uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> You mentioned that, uh, so a question about not our problem, right? So, as a team leader, have you faced such a situation, how you handle it? The problem is not on our side. Ah, I see, so the question is, the problem is not on our side. How a team leader can handle such situation and do I face this? Uh, of course, as a team leader, I face such situation. Um, and maybe team leader would be the first person who should indicate about that. Uh, to the product owners or the project leaders because he is the closest person that makes some decisions and he is the closest to the developers. So I think that sometimes team leader can handle this by his own if it's a problem, uh, I know, maybe technological problem that could be solved, but in most cases it's kind of organizational problem, like an issue and uh, it's, it's the team leader's uh, responsibility to take care that his team is really has no psychological influence of such productivity uh, degrees. So, something like this. Of course, uh, we should handle it. <laughs> Anyone else? Don't be ashamed. <laughs> okay, thank you then. And you can talk to me near the stage if you want.